Amen. If you have your Bibles, would you open with me to the book of Romans, chapter 1. Romans was written by the Apostle Paul to Christians in Rome, Christians that he had not yet met personally. And I believe Paul was planning a missionary trip through Rome on his way to Spain or someplace else, and he was trying to make their acquaintance. So this was a long letter of introduction, and the majority of the book of Romans is a detailed explanation of the gospel as Paul was preaching it throughout the world. It's possible that people were saying, you know, Paul has watered down the gospel, or he's not preaching the real gospel. So he spent most of Romans explaining in longhand, this is the gospel that I'm preaching. Let's start in verse 14. I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. As it is written, the righteous will live by faith. I'm going to call the word today unleashing the power of the gospel. I've come to share with you guys some of the most powerful words that the human race has ever heard. I've come to share words with you this morning that have been transforming lives and nations for over 2,000 years and words that will bring transformation into your world if you'll learn to share those. I've come here this morning to share with you the gospel. I began to notice something on television about a year ago that caught my attention. You're not going to catch this on CNN or any of the major networks. I have to watch Christian television and read some Christian news. But I began to see little blurbs about a group called Unite Us, And this group is going around to college campuses, stirring up all sorts of interesting things among the students. About a year ago, it was Auburn University, and that's my school, and all God's children said War Eagle, even though we got beat yesterday. But what I noticed is they had taken the basketball arena, which would seat about 15,000 people, and they crammed it full of college kids, but they weren't playing basketball. They were preaching the gospel. And so many of these young people responded to the message. They wanted to be baptized immediately pond in the back, and they baptized hundreds and hundreds of kids. And what I saw was Auburn's football coach was being criticized because he was out there baptizing students in the duck pond, and somebody said the coach shouldn't be doing things like that. I was paying attention. It's not every day that college students say, hey, let's all go get saved and baptized tonight. Amen? Shortly after that, I saw another little blurb down in Florida. They had baptized over 1,000 people at the pier, at the beach. And I don't remember it being a particular church group, but people were sharing the gospel, and they baptized like 1,000 people just down at the beach. And then I saw another from California at Pirate's Cove. Once again, at the beach, they were baptizing hundreds of people. And then the University of Alabama, and then Tennessee, and then Georgia. Last week, it was the University of Arkansas, the same exact thing. College students piling into an arena to hear the gospel and being baptized by the hundreds. Now, I'm not the smartest kid in the class, but when I see things like that, I have to stop and go, huh, I wonder if God's up to something. What do y'all think? Is God up to something? Is God up to something in the United States today that we desperately need? Are there little fires of revival beginning to burn all across our country? Now, when you go back and read books like Romans 2,000 years ago, I want you to notice that the church didn't have much money 2,000 years ago. They didn't have any real political power. But what they had was the power of the Holy Spirit 
And they understood how to release the power that is ours in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul said to the Christians at Rome, I want to come and I want to preach the gospel to you guys. Now these folks were already saved. They were already going to church. But Paul understood it's important to stir up that gospel message among God's people because when God's people are stirred up with the gospel, amazing things can happen. Amen? Down through church history, you can find revivals, you can find great awakenings, and almost every single time you'll find a small group of people who rediscovered what I'm going to share with y'all today, the power of the gospel. Now, I'm going to share the gospel today, and I'm going to do it for two very specific reasons. Number one, there are born-again people here today who need to hear this message and understand that's so simple, I could share that. A fifth grader could share this message. I want you to hear it, and I want you to be equipped. I want you to be stirred up because Holy Spirit is going to bring people into your path who need to hear the gospel. And if you're walking in the Spirit, you're going to share it. Number two, there are people here today who are going to realize, I've never responded to that message. You're going to begin to feel Holy Spirit tugging at you this morning, saying you need to respond to the gospel. You're going to be given an opportunity this morning to ask Jesus to come in, and you're going to leave here a very different person today. You say, well, how does it work? What's the gospel? How do I explain it? How do I receive it? Let's answer that by looking into this passage and uncovering several steps that we must all take to release the power of of the gospel. Are y'all ready for step number one? Step number one, if we're going to release the power of the gospel, we must identify and communicate mankind's real problem. This is what I call the real problem. Verse 16, Paul says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. The word salvation is something that you might want to circle or underline in your Bible. I come from Alabama where people would just walk up to you and say, hey, brother, you just need to be saved. Don't you want to get saved? Have you all ever heard that word? Do you believe there are people in America today who don't know what that means, who don't have the foggiest notion of what you're talking about when you start talking about salvation? I've been in sales for over 25 years, and if you want to sell almost anything, you have to help people identify their problem before you present your solution. And if they don't understand their problem, they're not going to be eager for your solution. So when I share Jesus, I start here, and I stay on this particular spot until they accept the fact that we have a very real problem. If we were on board the Titanic and the ship has just hit an iceberg, what's our real problem? Anybody? We about to sink. Are we all about to die? Is it a bad situation? What if a person walked up to me and said, hey, I don't like the furniture on this deck. We need to rearrange the deck furniture. Am I engaging in that conversation? Why not? Has nothing to do with our real problem. Our real problem is we need to get into the lifeboats. People are about to die. This is a perilous situation. If a doctor walks in and says, hey, you've got cancer, and it's deadly, and it's serious, and we've got to treat it, and we have a treatment that works, but you've got to get on it right now. What's your real problem? You've got cancer. Are you worried about anything else? Are you worried about having bags under your eyes? Are you worried about what kind of car you're driving or what kind of house you live in? What's your real problem? You got cancer, and you better fix it or it's going to eat you up. The human race has one problem, and if you help people identify this problem, they are prepared for the solution. I'm going to give it to you on a cracker. Here's the problem. We have all been separated from God. That's the problem. Read the Bible from cover to cover. The Bible says we were created for a relationship with God. 
The highest level of existence that you're ever going to enjoy is in that relationship with God for which you were created. Genesis chapter 3 says that the very first humans, Adam and Eve, had face-to-face fellowship with God. They were living as full as they could possibly live until. What'd they do? They rebelled with a little help from the devil But the devil came into the Garden of Eden and suggested that you could live a fuller life apart from God. You shouldn't let God tell you what to do. Make up your own mind. Make your own decisions. God says, don't eat that. Go ahead and eat it. Have a good time. You only live once. What happened when Adam and Eve rebelled against God? Immediately, the relationship was severed. Immediately, Adam and Eve began to run and hide from God rather than drawing close to God. And the storyline of the Bible is the story of how God went to great lengths to restore the relationship for which you were created. The real problem is we've been separated from God, and deep down in our hearts, we know it. Don't people hint at the notion that we should be living on a certain level, but we're not. We're down here. Don't we hear songs that say things like, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. If I could just make a little more money, if I could just marry the right person, if I could just have a house in that certain neighborhood, if I could just reach a certain level on the career ladder, I'm looking for something. I lie awake in bed at night and I wonder, isn't there more to life? The answer is yes. Jesus said, I've come that they might have life and have it to the full. He's come that you might be restored to that relationship for which you are yearning. Don't we also sort of hint that we're aware that we should be living morally at a certain level and we can't quite get there? I don't like to use the word sin when I talk to pre-Christians because in this day and age, people will freak out when you use the word sin. Don't tell me I'm a sinner. What's sin for you might not be sin for me. Nobody tells me what's right for me. You're just judging me. You're just a Bible thumper, hypocrite. So I don't use the word sin usually. I use words that can be descriptive of sin. If you look up sin in a Bible dictionary, you'll find words like rebellion, lawlessness, iniquity. And if we think about it, we'll realize that those things happen in our lives all the time, even if we don't believe in Jesus yet. How many of y'all have ever noticed that you don't have to teach little children how to lie? Some of y'all young parents that have that first baby that's so sweet, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, when they start talking, they'll start lying. (laughs) Who broke mama's favorite lamp? Oh, it might have been a monster. I come from a family with nine kids. There was always some other kid you could point to, anybody but me. I had a sister that used to bite herself on the arm and go show mama and say the younger sister did it just to get the younger sister beat. And nobody had to teach her to do that. We come forth from the womb in this condition, and we recognize you shouldn't act that way, but we do. How many of y'all have ever seen the speed limit sign that said 55 miles an hour and said, I'm going to drive 70 if I want to? And then you get on the interstate and it says 70, and you say, I'm going to drive 90 if I want to. Nobody tells me how fast to drive until the cop pulls you over and you say, I didn't see that speed limit sign. And the trooper says, there is no place in Georgia where you can drive 90. You act like you were trying to qualify for the Talladega 500. Why are you driving so fast? I'll tell you, because I'm a sinner. And deep down in my soul, something is twisted. And I'm aware that it's been twisted, but I can't really do anything about it. There's a story in the the Gospel of Luke in chapter 15 that we often call the story of the prodigal son. And in this story, a son says to his father, give me my share of the inheritance. I can't stand you. I got to get out of here. I want to go do my own thing. And the father gives him his inheritance. And he goes off into the far country. And he blows all his money on wine, women, and crazy living. 
And when he's flat broke, the Bible says, he finds himself hungry. He finds himself unable to get anything. The only job he can find is feeding pigs. And he's so hungry, he's longing to fill his stomach with the pods that he's feeding the pigs. And this is a description of every person on the face of the earth. We were designed to be in the presence of our Father, but because of our own sin, our own rebellion, we're in the pig pen, and some of us are beginning to realize it. When young people on college campuses are coming to hear the gospel and want to be baptized by the thousands, people are beginning to wake up and realize, I'm in the pig pen, and I don't want to be. I'm not designed for the pig pen. The lead singer for the rock and roll band Three Doors Down, a guy named Brad Arnold, has become a born-again Christian, and he's sharing his faith at rock and roll concerts. And he says, the response by and large is positive. People are responding in a positive way. They're eager to hear what we have to offer. They're eager because they understand I have a problem. I can't quite put my finger on it. You know what the problem is. What is it? Every human being on planet Earth has been separated from God by our personal sin. Can you handle step number two? How do we release the power of the gospel? Step number two is this. Understand and communicate what I'm going to call the offer. Understand and communicate the offer. Let's look at verse 17. For in the gospel... The righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. The second word I'm going to pull out of this passage is the word righteousness. God is offering to make us righteous. If we went to a restaurant, and if I stood up at the restaurant and said, hey, it's my anniversary, I'm excited, this is my credit card, I've got a deep credit limit, I'm offering to pay for everybody's dinner, how many would let me buy you dinner? What's the offer? I'm offering to pay for what? Your dinner. Am I offering to make your car payment? Am I offering to pay off your student debt? I'm offering to pay off one very specific thing. What is it? Your tab. Yeah, for dinner. God is making a very specific offer in the gospel, and it is the offer to pay your sin debt. It is the offer to pay for every time I've ever lied or cheated or rebelled against God and to make me righteous. The word righteous is something that you really need to take hold of if you're going to share the gospel. Turn over to Romans chapter 3 for just a minute. I'm going to start reading in verse 21. And if you just mark these passages and share them, you can share the gospel. Notice how many times Paul's going to use righteousness in this passage of Scripture. He's trying, to, he's trying to make a point. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement, through the shedding of his blood, to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. I have conversations with people and I'll ask the same questions over and over again. And one of my favorite questions is this. If you died right now, would you go to heaven? Number one answer, I think so. 
I hope so. And I'll say, well, what makes you think so? Number one answer, I'm a pretty good person. I take care of my family. I try to live by the golden rule. And my follow-up is always something like this. Are you good enough to go to heaven? And people usually look at me pretty, pretty strange. I'll say, how good are you on a scale of 1 to 10? 10 being perfect. Number one answer, 6. 5 is just average. They'll say, I'm just a little bit above average. I'm not a saint. I'm about a 6. Maybe a 7, but I know I'm not a 10. And I'll say, that's great. God's a 10. And in order to go to heaven, you have to be a 10. And you just admitted you're a 6. Here's the gospel. God will take the 10 that is Jesus and apply it to your 6. And he'll take your 6 and lay it on Jesus. God will make you a 10. That is the offer. How many of y'all are old enough to remember a day when you could write a check and it didn't clear the bank instantly? It might take three or four days. And if you're married and you have a joint checking account, sometimes one spouse will write a check and they won't stub it, and the other spouse will get the checkbook and go, oh, no, you just wrote a $100 check, and we don't have enough money in the bank. What's going to happen if we don't cover the check? It's going to bounce. In the gospel, what we see is that we have all written checks for sin and that we can't cover those checks. I don't want to cover my check. How about that? And Jesus has stepped in and said, if you'll let me, I'll cover that check for you. You have insufficient funds. I have all the credit in the universe. I'm offering to pay your tab. This one point separates Christianity from almost every world religion. Almost every world religion says if you want to be right with God, you have to do something. You have to climb a mountain. You have to walk over hot coals. You have to fast until you pass out, whatever the case may be. Christianity says, no, you can't do it. You can't fix it. You broke it. But through Jesus Christ, God became a man and came into the world to do for you what you can't do for yourself. When he died on the cross, the offer was, I'll pay your tab for you. There was a great movie that came out several years ago called The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Anybody ever seen that? C.S. Lewis wrote the book. We took the kids to see it in the theater. And it is the gospel. The Jesus character is portrayed by a lion called Aslan. And there is a scene where a boy, I believe his name was Edmund, had gone into the kingdom of Narnia and had broken one of the laws. And he did it. He was guilty. And the witch queen of Narnia came forward and said, the law says he has to die, and I'm going to kill him. And the lion took the witch aside and said, I'll die in his place. Let the boy go. And she really wanted to kill the lion anyway. So she said, fair trade. The guilty boy went free. And the Jesus character, the lion, went into the enemy's camp. He was surrounded by all sorts of evil creatures. He allowed himself to be tied. He allowed his mane to be cut off. And he laid down on a stone pavement. And the witch drove a stake through his heart. Boom! And killed him. And every person in the theater went, <gasps> And my kids went, <gasps> And being the good father that I am, I leaned up and said, don't worry, he's going to rise from the dead. And the kids said, have you seen this movie? And I said, no, but I know the gospel when I see it. I know this story. The story is presented in a form that kids can enjoy it and understand it, but I'm a grown man, and I understand that Jesus died for me to make me righteous. Now, over the years, I've heard people say, I tried Jesus, and he didn't work. Y'all ever heard that? I went to church for a while. I tried Jesus, and he didn't work. And my standard answer is, how do you know he, he didn't work? You're not dead yet. If you die in Christ and go to hell, then you can tell me Jesus didn't work. 
But until that time, the offer that I understood 30 years ago was that I had committed this boatload of sins and Jesus would pay that off and make me righteous if I let him. He didn't offer to give you a new car or a bigger house or a prettier girlfriend or any of that stuff. The offer on the table is you have sinned, you have been separated from God, I'll pay your tab if you'll let me. Can you all handle step number three? Amen? Here comes step number three, and to me, this is one of the most important steps. If we're going to communicate the gospel, I have to get this one right. Step number three, I have to understand and communicate what I'm going to call the response. The response. Let's go back to chapter one, Romans chapter one. And Paul said in verse 17, For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. If I communicated three things to a person about the gospel, it would be their condition, separated from God, the offer, God will make you righteous through Jesus, and the response, the word Paul uses here again and again, is the word faith. Now, let's go back to the restaurant. I stand up with a credit card and say, I'm excited. It's my anniversary. I'm willing to pay for your dinner. How many of y'all are going to let me pay for your dinner? That's just one. How many of y'all are going to let me pay for your dinner? We're at the Bull and Barrel, and your check is pretty big. How many of y'all are going to let me pay for your, bit for your dinner? Here's the catch. When the waiter comes around with your check, you have to say, I'm with John. If you don't say, I'm with John, you're going to have to pay for it yourself. How many of y'all are going to say, I'm with John? There's an offer, but is the offer yours until you tell the waiter, I'm on his ticket? The offer is pending, but you got to take hold of it. How about this? If I offered to sell you my house for $250,000, and you say, I want it. We sign a contract with a realtor, and you put down some earnest money. Is the house yours yet? No. What has to happen before the house becomes yours? We have to go to a closing. We have to sign papers. Real money has to change hands. When we walk out of that closing, is the house yours? Yes. It's an offer. But there is acceptance. There's an offer on the table since Jesus died on the cross. For 2,000 years, there's been an offer on the table to pay your sin debt, but you have to respond. And if you don't respond, you can pay your tab yourself. And the Apostle Paul would be adamant that the only acceptable response in God's economy is faith. The word believe and the word faith can be used interchangeably. I'll meet people over the years who will say, but I do believe, I do believe in Jesus. Not just believing with your head, not just agreeing with the facts. The word faith means to trust Jesus completely. To trust Jesus with every fiber of my being. How many have ever flown on an airplane? I got on a plane recently and I had never met the pilots. I never saw the pilots. I sat down in a seat and read a magazine while they flew me up to 33,000 feet halfway across the country and put me down, and I trusted them how much with my life? Completely. Anybody here ever had an operation? I let a Georgia fan cut me open a few years ago. I'm from Auburn now. I know I don't, I don't do Georgia, but I knew he was a Georgia fan because he had on a skull cap with a bulldog on it. And I only met this guy one time for like five minutes. And they wheeled me into an operating room, and I laid down on a table, and I knew good and well he was about to cut me open with a bone saw. He was about to stop my heart, take a vein out of my leg and put two bypasses in my heart, and then jump me off again with jumper cables and sew me up with something that felt like a G-string from an electric guitar. And I let him do it. Why did I let him do it? I didn't have much choice. How much trust did I put in that man? All of it. When we start talking about responding to the offer that Jesus has laid on the table, the word faith or believe is used again and again, and he means I'm trusting Jesus with all of it. 
When I say, if you died right now, would you go to heaven? And I hear somebody say, I think so. And I say, what makes you think so? And he comes back and says, well, because I'm a pretty good person. What's he trusting in to make him right with God? Self. What's the only answer? I have put my total trust in Jesus. There's a second word in the New Testament that's used again and again that is repent. If you read Acts chapter 2, a crowd shouted at Peter, what must we do to be saved? And Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you. And as I've studied the Bible, I've come to realize that repent and believe are one swift motion. Repent means to say the same thing as. Call it what it is. Repent means to turn 180 degrees, like making a U-turn in a car. It's like saying, I'm not going to live this way anymore. I did it. I'm sorry for it. And swiftly turning to Jesus and saying, I'm trusting you to somehow make me righteous. Believe it or not, you're going to find this if you go out and share your faith. You're going to find a lot of people who've been in church for years who've never repented and believed. You'll find a lot of people who will agree with you on points of theology who've never repented and believed. Martin Luther was a Catholic priest, had been in church all his life. He was teaching at a seminary in Wittenberg, Germany. I mean, he'd been in the priesthood for a long time. And he read this very passage of Scripture preparing to teach a class on the book of Romans. And for the first time in his life, he came face to face with the fact he'd never repented and believed. He'd never really put his faith in Jesus Christ. The Catholic Church had told him up to that point, if you want to be right with God, you've got to be a Catholic. And you've got to partake in the sacraments. And you have to go to confession. And back in those days, you got to put a certain amount of money in the offering plate. And Martin Luther came face to face with the fact that he had been misinformed, but that he was a very religious church-going man who had never received the offer. My dad was 80 years old, had been baptized as a young man during World War II. The Japanese were bombing, and they stopped bombing for just long enough. My dad grabbed a Navy chaplain and said, baptize me now, and he was baptized. People that knew him after that wondered if the Navy chaplain held him under long enough because he was not a different person, but he'd been baptized. He went to church every Sunday because my mama made him. But at 80 years old, I finally convinced him, you have never really put faith in Jesus Christ. He didn't have any assurance of salvation. And and he believed, and his life was different from that day forward. In Alcoholics Anonymous, they have 12 steps. The first step is this. We admitted that we were powerless over alcohol and that our lives had become unmanageable. I am a recovering alcoholic, and I'll tell you, I started drinking at 12. And I would have said, most alcoholics will tell you, I'm not an alcoholic. I don't have a problem. My wife has a problem. She follows me around all the time, keeping tabs on me. It's the police. The police have a problem. They, they, they pull me over every time I leave my house. It's the judge. The judge has a problem. He gives me a DUI every time I appear in front of him. I don't have a problem. Your life changes the day you face it and say, you know what? I do have a problem. The problem's me. And you admit. This is sort of like repent, believe. I admitted that I was powerless over alcohol and my life is a disaster and I want something different. And we came to believe. Those words in the 12 steps are their own purpose. We came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity if he were sought. I met a fellow years ago named Shorty Gooden. And my wife is here with me. Lisa is one of the most evangelistic people I've ever met. She loves people so much. She's going to share the gospel. Sometimes I'll let somebody go by and Lisa will grab them. And Shorty was a mess. He had been a bootlegger for many years in Alabama. Our home county was dry. And that meant you could not buy alcohol. You could not possess alcohol. If you came across the county line with beer in the cooler in the back of your truck and you got pulled over, you were going to jail. It was dry. And people like Shorty would bring in alcohol by the 18-wheeler load, and they would have these little houses out in the country. You had to know where the bootleggers were, but you could go out there and flash your headlights, and they'd bring you something out to drink. Shorty was one of those. 
Later in life, he retired from bootlegging, and he went into bounty hunting. He was a bounty hunter. So he had all these colorful stories, and I was preaching at a little church out in the country, and Shorty would show up on Sundays, and he would listen, and you could tell the Holy Spirit was dealing with him, but he would just never respond. And my wife and I would go out and talk to Shorty and his wife. We'd drink coffee. We'd listen to tales. We'd share the gospel, and we would always get to this point, repent, believe. And Shorty would always stop us. We found out he had been in World War II. He fought in the Battle of the Bulge, which I'm told had atrocities committed on both sides. And the best I could understand it, Shorty had not just killed a bunch of people, he had done some hideous things in his military service. And he would stop almost as if to say, it's too hideous for me to even face let alone repent. And it's too horrible that God could even forgive me. He wouldn't say it out loud, but that's what we discerned. The last time we went over there, we all but begged him to get saved. And you really can't beg somebody to get saved, but we were begging Shorty, and he wouldn't do it. And we found out a couple days later that he had dropped dead of a heart attack, dead as soon as he hit the floor. And as sad as it made us, we both agreed the last time we saw him, we shared the gospel with him. And if he didn't respond to Jesus Christ, it's not because we didn't love him enough to open up our mouths and say, Shorty, you have a problem. You're separated from God. There's a deal on the table where Jesus said he'll pay your sin tab if you'll let him. If you'll repent and if you'll put faith in Christ, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how low you've sunk. I spent seven years on the road with a rock and roll band playing music. I went through the Breaking Free class here last year. I recommend it to everybody. But I came in here with about six pages typed of stuff I had done that needed to be dealt with. I knew how bad I was. But 30 years ago, people began to share the gospel with me friends began to reach out and share Jesus with me. And it wasn't the first one or the second one or probably the third one, but somewhere along the line, it got through. Somewhere along the line, I began to realize that I was living beneath my potential, that being a drug addict and an alcoholic wasn't the way I wanted to live my whole life, that I had sinned and I knew I had sinned. And I faced it. This is where a lot of people walk away from Christianity. You got to face it. Call it what it is. It was disgusting, but it only hurt for a second. It was like pulling a thorn out of your foot. It only hurts for a second, and when I turned to Jesus, it was gone. I haven't had a drink in 30 years. I haven't used narcotics in 30 years. My marriage is back together where it was on the brink of a divorce, and I'm telling you this is the most powerful message not only that I've ever heard but that I've ever shared. The most exciting thing I have ever done in my life is leading another soul out of the darkness and into the presence of God through Jesus Christ. Amen. Romans chapter 10 says, if you'll confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. All those who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes, and I'm going to close with this. How many born-again Christians are in this room today or watching by television who would have to say, Holy Spirit's dealing with me. I need to be sharing this message. We have special training coming up this Saturday. How many people need to say, today before I leave here, I'm going to sign up for the evangelism event this Saturday. I'm going to be here. How many would say, as Holy Spirit leads, I'm going to open my mouth and I'm going to share the gospel. You might have friends, family members who need to respond right now. You might be the very instrument that God uses to bring the gospel to those people. How many here this morning, how many watching by TV would have to say, I'm realizing that I've never received the offer. I've known about it. I could tell you about it. But for the first time, I realize I've never really repented and believed. I've never really put my trust in Jesus to make me right with God. There is no sinner's prayer in the Bible. But if the Holy Spirit's dealing with your heart right now, you can pray to God. 
And you can say something like this, Lord, I have sinned. I am truly sorry. Please forgive me. Jesus, I believe that you died for my sin. I'm repenting. I'm turning to you. I'm trusting you to make me right with God. I receive you now as my Lord, my Savior. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If we have prayer team members, I want to invite you guys to come up to the altar. I'm going to dismiss the service in a minute. But if you're here this morning and you need prayer, if you're here this morning and you've just asked Jesus to come into your heart, these people are here to pray with you. They're here to encourage you for your next step, which is water baptism. But we want to celebrate with you. The Bible says there's a celebration going on in heaven right now over any one sinner who repents. If you're watching by television, you can reach out to us through our website. You can reach out through YouTube. Leave a, leave a comment. I prayed to receive Christ. We'll reach out to you this week. Lord, I thank you for the gospel. I thank you that we belong to a church that is serious about declaring the gospel. And I'm asking you to set a fire in us. Our nation needs renewal. We need the power of the gospel. I release these people into your power, your protection, your provision. And until I see you again, I pray the Lord bless you and keep you. And all God's children said, Amen. If you need prayer, we're going to be here to pray with you. I invite you to come now. The Lord bless you.